Faith Rogers, host of today's program, COVID-19, Keeping Up with a Moving Target. This is the May 27th update of DKB Med Radio's Coronavirus Educational Series. Thank you for joining us. As a reminder, we are providing twice weekly 15 minute webcasts and podcasts on Wednesday evenings and Friday mornings, featuring the latest news, treatment updates, and clinical considerations, as well as answering your questions about COVID-19. Sign up at covid19.dkbmed.com to be sure you get the latest updates. Today's program is accredited for ANCC and AMA PRA Category 1 credits. Please visit our website for complete CME and CE information. To attest for CME and CE credit, please visit covid19.dkbmed.com. There, you will also find all of our previous COVID-19 programs and have access to other free CME and CE programs on a wide range of topics. The slides for today's webinar and previous webinars can be found under the resource tab. Today's learning objectives are, describe factors associated with secondary infections, discuss clinical effects of viral shedding, and discuss current data pertaining to use of remdesivir. And with us today, we have Dr. Paul Allwater, the Clinical Director of the Division of Infectious Disease at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. Thanks for your time, Dr. Allwater. Thank you, Faith. Uh, and I uh, always want to acknowledge the generous support of DKB Med, the Postgraduate Institute of Medicine, and also the Institute for Johns Hopkins Nursing. There are additional resources and educational activities available through DKB Med at their covid19.dkbmed.com site. So please visit. So as we are, are moving through cases, I, you know, we show this map. I think it's no longer quite as relevant as it was. Uh, I think for many of us, uh, we all acknowledge that COVID-19 is circulating in communities. It perhaps is still striking people, unfortunately, who are living in more congregate and grouped environments or in larger families. Also, uh, people that may not be able to socially distance as easily and also institutionalized settings. But uh, the risks remain and many states have uh, elected to move ahead uh, and re-engage various sectors of the economy. And a number of these uh, photographs circulated from 100 years ago in the pandemic. And of course, the professional and college and other sports worlds, uh, youth leagues have all mostly ground to a halt. Some are reawakening, but these photos remind us that even back in the influenza pandemic, attempts were made to play sports or or watch football, for example. And, and it'll be interesting to see exactly how this will work. Obviously, in many ways, uh, this virus is much harder to acquire outdoors. I think anything outdoors certainly lowers risks tremendously, even with a modest amount of social distancing. But the really high-risk venues still remain uh, large groups of people in environments where circulation may not be as good indoors. That can include uh, churches and synagogues, for example, could include a retail shopping. These are things where uh, wearing masks are helpful to help prevent unintentional transmission for people who may not realize they're sick. But these are all aspects that I think many are working out and, and also for colleges and universities um, that are trying to understand whether they can reopen safely in the fall. For the rest of this webinar, I did want to focus more on some issues that I believe are coming up in hospitalized patient management frequently. For those of you who are right on the front lines and caring for patients, I think many know the well-acknowledged complications in influenza of experiencing so-called double sickening and a secondary pneumonia, most famously with a methicillin resistant staph aureus, but this can also include routine community acquired pathogens. And uh, there's a sense that this may also occur frequently, especially in more critically ill COVID-19 patients. 
Uh, there are a couple of studies that are beginning to emerge for patients that are especially been struck uh, and severely ill, landing in the intensive care unit, often with mechanical ventilation. A recent paper published in Clinical Infectious Diseases gave a range uh, looking at the literature of 13 to 44 percent. And, and interestingly, this virus does cause a low white count initially, and there's a sense that interferon is inhibited and there may be other immunological perturbations that allow these so-called nosocomial pathogens to be especially set up shop. What's a little unclear is if this is any more common yet than anyone that's on a prolonged mechanical ventilator, but you see a number of the typical pathogens here, bacterial and mold, such as aspergillus, uh, especially in patients that might be previously colonized, such as lung transplants. And the time of onset of symptoms to this concern for secondary infection is anywhere from uh, 10 to 17 days. And yet in this group, many unfortunately succumb before their third week has passed. So these may be terminal events, uh, possibly. It's difficult, though, to interpret the literature precisely because many of these reports are coming from China and New York City. And there, understandably, uh, clinicians have elected to give antibiotics uh, very frequently uh, because these are patients that proceduralists don't wish to go and get samples due to concern for aerosolizing the virus. Antifungals are also administered in a subset. And I'll say at Johns Hopkins, we use a beta D glucan screen in the serum. This is a fungal marker to try to gauge risk for something like aspergillus and whether to use voriconazole. And at least in these reports, uh, corticosteroids were frequently used. And I think this may be less likely the case in uh, Europe or North America, but the whole uh, concept of whether you use steroids to tamp down the hyperinflammation of COVID-19 is still something to be addressed. Starting off with the Chinese guidelines uh, many months ago now, an anti-IL-6, interleukin-6 strategy using uh, a monoclonal antibody called tocilizumab was in their guidelines. And a number of centers have used this drug to some degree in an effort to try to, again, cool down patients from this so-called cytokine storm, which seems to be driving a lot of illness. Now, this is a preprint. This is not yet in press, but comes from a group that uh, looked at patients that had received both tocilizumab and those that didn't. Obviously, there's issues here. But if you look at their illness, they, they were relatively closely matched uh, here, so there wasn't a a lot that seem different. But if you look at bacterial infections, and not unsurprisingly, if you get rid of a, a vital interleukin response, there seem to be more bacterial infections and at least a trend, although the numbers are very low for additional fungal infections. So I think this will await more because there are a huge number of clinical trials, not only using tocilizumab, but other monoclonal antibodies such as clazakizumab, uh, which is an anti-interleukin-6, anakinrin, anti-IL-1, a drug uh, that inhibits GMCSF. Any of these are being studied now. We'll get a better sense from randomized clinical trials about the true risk but something to be on the watch for, especially if these drugs are employed in your patients. Another key question that comes up frequently in hospitalized patients are, we need to send this patient to a rehabilitation facility, we're doing another swab, and the CDC had recommended that two negative swabs are needed to remove uh, so-called airborne and respiratory uh, precautions. And what do you do with someone that's in their fourth or fifth or sixth week of hospitalization and they still have a positive test? Is that person still infectious? We had some indication uh, from this paper in Nature who looked at a really a small number, only nine patients who are either mildly ill or asymptomatic. And this, I won't walk you through all the charts, but if you look at G, you'll see by day 10, none of these patients were a virus able to be cultured. And this was about the same time that antibodies started to be made in earnest uh, with most patients uh, having uh, develop them by day 14. So, you know, you can sort of think about from day 10 to 14 after onset of symptoms that a virus isn't being transmitted. But 
Does this apply to sick and hospitalized patients? Uh, patients who are under critical illness may have gotten steroids, suppressed their immune systems and so on. And then uh, just because you can't detect it by viral culture, that's a fairly insensitive assay and perhaps people still are infectious. However, we, there's some, I thought, interesting studies that have been performed by uh, what's often called the Korean CDC that uh, looked at so-called repositives. And what these were are patients who had been in hospital, they were discharged with a negative test, and then they were screened on average about 14 days after stopping isolation, many at home, but some of whom had recrudescent symptoms such as just fever and so on. And uh, of that group of 285, a number of these people were repositive. So the virus was again found, but it was again just by molecular assay. And the question was, is are these patients infectious? And so how they went about this was by contact tracing of family members and other close contacts in 790 people. And in these repositives, no cases of transmission were found. So, you know, if there was a canary in the coal mine um, uh, that this uh, repositives represented, it doesn't seem to pose great infectious risk. Now, that doesn't mean these viral remnants, uh, which are not maybe full intact replicating virus, aren't somehow creating some kind of immune response or uh, recrudescent fever, that may be. But at least I think this has given us some reassurance that patients are no longer infectious. And so for anyone that might be two to three weeks in their illness, I think, although there's still not definitive information on this, that the chances of that person and infecting someone else is really quite low. And this was borne out, if you give an, a look at when these patients were tested, some of them 82 days after illness, if you look. So people can shed, at least by viral carriage, the uh, enough RNA to be detected by a nasopharyngeal swab. And at least the CDC, which previously had been managed these people with isolation and so on, have now determined because of this study that these repositives do not require isolation. A few words about therapies. Uh, last week, uh, preliminary results from remdesivir came out, uh, published in the New England Journal. Um, this is still quite a preliminary analysis. Uh, actually, the last patient only completed their 28 day from what I understood last week. So the full analysis will probably only be out in June. In April, there was a press release that there was a reduced length of stay from 15 days to 11 in the patients who received remdesivir, and this was therefore viewed as a positive result. This further analysis showed that the drug, which is a nucleoside analog, is fairly safe. But if you look at subgroups, that is uh, groups that, as in panel D, those who received high flow oxygen or non-invasive mechanical ventilation, and those who needed ventilators or ECMO in panel E, uh, seem to have a fair amount of overlap. Um, these were probably patients later in their illness uh, where maybe the antiviral properties of the drug didn't have as much effect. And at least at this 14 day mark uh, in terms of analysis as a minimum for these patients, there was not an observable difference. However, patients who required oxygen, as you can see in panel C, there was quite a divergence with the sense of the population that recovered uh, who received remdesivir is greater. And although there wasn't a statistical uh, benefit for mortality, there was certainly a strong trend and, and indeed uh, certainly so in this C group, but this was also the largest group in this study. So still more to be learned about this drug, but the a uh, drug, at least in the United States, has been a scarce resource. And so many hospitals are allocating it to people in their first week or so of symptoms or the first 10 days or so. And those that aren't been uh, ill in the hospital for weeks and so on based on this study. Another promising treatment for yet uh, still investigational and for which we really do not have definitive answers, just like remdesivir, uh, is the use of convalescent plasma, uh, which a number of studies are underway. But this is the best study that I know to date. Again, a preprint. It is not yet been peer reviewed, but is information from Sinai, Mount Sinai, New York, that uh, with the New York Blood Bank being one of the 
first to really gather enough donors who had survived COVID-19 and then administered uh, plasma to recipients. And what this group did was used historical matched controls with COVID-19. And you can see here at least that uh, there was a benefit at day 14 in terms of patients who, uh, in terms of their oxygen requirements here in those who uh, receive convalescent plasma. And so the odds ratio was relatively modest uh, at 86%, but the survival, although fairly broad confidence intervals as a hazard ratio uh, was uh, 19%. But this only applied to non-intubated patients. Again, suggesting that convalescent plasma, if it's used, should be given early in the course of hospitalization if it were to have benefit. So, uh, Faith, that's all I have for you this week. Uh, there's always much to be learned uh, yet, and, um, and every week certainly brings more that we're incorporating into clinical practices. Uh, I think we do have some questions, though. Thank you for those updates. We will now continue to the listener Q&A. Dr. Allwater, this is our first question. Are there any predisposing factors or conditions that have been identified for the multisystem inflammatory syndrome in children outside of COVID-19? Yeah, Faith, uh, this uh, really has raised a lot of concerns. Of course, uh, the experience in the New York metro area where there have been over 100, or I believe even 150 children who have been identified with this, but yet we're still learning about it. Some papers that have come out of the United Kingdom, a small number of papers, too, have suggested that uh, patients there, I believe three quarters were of Afro-Caribbean descent and that there was a male majority. The average age there was 11 years of age. Uh, in New York City, there were older children, but um, the average age was more around eight and a half. And 64% of the group that was initially put together by the health department met Kawasaki criteria, but yet they were more ill. I think most importantly was the word that most of these children did not have identifiable underlying health factors. They didn't have asthma, they didn't have obesity, and so on. So uh, uh, to date, uh, certainly this will be looked at more closely as we're in the first few weeks of understanding this syndrome, but uh, that's sort of what we know now. Thank you, Dr. Allwater. Our last question, are we any closer to more reliable serum antibody testing? Yeah, Faith, I think it depends what you mean by reliable. Uh, so I think there are a number of reliable ones now that probably mean that a positive result you can trust means that you've likely been exposed. And a negative one, as long as you've waited long enough after the illness, probably means that you didn't experience the novel coronavirus. Uh, the Abbott test is one that has published very reasonable data there. The Centers for Disease Control Serology, which some might consider the gold standard at the moment, is an ELISA-based antibody that uses purified uh, spike protein, one of the key envelope proteins of the virus. And the CDC says that this is 99% specific and 96% specific. So meaning, uh, you know, it's not quite up to HIV standards, but pretty darn close. Now, if you're asking reliable for whether this antibody test means you're immune, that's a slightly different question. I don't think we yet know enough. We have to check for neutralizing antibodies. And it's also important that we're learning more and more that antibodies alone may not provide the kind of protective responses that certain T-cell epitopes are also very important. And we discussed that last week, which was very much more a vaccine-focused webinar. So anyone that's interested may want to take a look at that uh, series. But we still don't have that immunological passport, meaning, you know, oh, you know, I know I'm antibody positive and I, I feel I won't transmit. Part of this is because quite honestly, with influenza, uh, you can have evidence of antibodies yet still harbor the virus and transmit. Now, that's not likely in the first few months after illness, but you know what's going to happen later this year if you do have waning immunity and so on. So I think it's best for everybody not to feel 
that this test gives them some kind of uh, impenetrable armor, but still to practice social distancing and, and take care, especially if you uh, have people at risk for ill health at home. Okay, thank you for those updates. As a reminder to claim CME or CE credit, please complete the evaluation at covid19.dkbmed.com and select today's activity. You'll receive your certificate immediately after. Any questions or issues, feel free to email us at the address listed. To submit questions, please send them to qa at dkbmed.com. That's Q as in question, A as in answer at dkbmed.com. Don't forget to access our resource center at covid19.dkbmed.com. You'll find a range of information, including the latest COVID-19 data and statistics, medical society guidelines, and resources in Spanish. To all of our listeners, please be on the lookout for our next activity this Friday. We will send out an email when it is available later this week. Again, thanks for joining us, and thank you for your dedication to your patients with COVID-19. Thank you, Dr. Allwater. Thank you, Faith, and uh, thanks very much again for listening and uh, for everyone that's helping on all fronts uh, with the COVID-19 effort. Uh, uh, you know, this goes with great appreciation, and, and if you have uh, questions, please send them in and we'll try to get them answered.